Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful episode of the Bradley Lectures podcast. I'm Tal Fortgang. I'm your host. I'm a researcher in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Department here at the American Enterprise Institute, which technically makes me a colleague of our guest today. And though he has uh, many titles, I can confidently say, at the very least, that our new department has subsumed Ramesh Panuru's position. Ramesh, welcome to the Bradley Lectures podcast. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction, I Oh, guess. there's more. There's more. Uh, well, for those uh, who don't know, and I imagine most of our listeners are familiar with Ramesh's work, he writes about just about everything for just about every major publication, primarily National Review and Bloomberg. He's a frequent guest on the Sunday news shows. Uh, today, we're going to revisit University of Chicago law professor Michael McConnell's 1992 Bradley Lecture, which he called Freedom of Religion versus Freedom from Religion. And before we get to that, I, I want to discuss a recent piece of yours, Ramesh, that uh, appeared in National Review about a month ago. It was called The First Freedom Fades. First Freedom, of course, referring to the free exercise of religion clause in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Why should we be concerned about the first freedom fading? Well, uh, it is the first freedom, right? I think the fact that it is the first liberty mentioned specifically in the Constitution is uh, a fact that ought to be arresting, um, that uh, has a significance we ought to ponder. And uh, I, I think that it is under threat uh, that it's often been contested in American history but we now have a fairly sizable block of uh, secular progressives, if you will, who are hostile or indifferent or uncomprehending of the value of religious freedom. And so you're seeing new efforts to legislatively curtail it and uh, new rhetorical efforts to undermine its importance. Um, no, I don't think that religious freedom is at death's door by any means, but I do think that it is in need of a defense that it hasn't needed uh, up until this point. So you, you mentioned that we've, we've obviously come a long way from our 18th century conception of what, what Professor McConnell calls enthusiastic support for uh, religious freedom to today where there's one party or at least one wing within a party that... Uh, really threatens the very fundamentals of uh, free exercise and even freedom of religious conscience. How did we get here? How, can you trace, this is a small request, can you trace the trajectory of American attitudes towards religious freedom uh, over the course of uh, our country's history? Uh, I am tempted to respond, no, <laughs> I, I can't do that. Um, but what I would say is that there are some, there have been some very significant changes that have altered the way these controversies tend to play out. So one of them is the growth of government. So when the government is playing a much larger role in um, welfare services that are also provided by religious organizations, you have an increasing potential for conflict. So if the government is giving grants to help the homeless, for example, um, can those grants go to religious organizations? Can they go to religious organizations that proselytize uh, to their beneficiaries? You get this whole host of questions. Second, you've got the expansion of the role of the courts in American life, and particularly you've got uh, the incorporation doctrine where state government's actions start to be seen as impinging on the federal constitution in a way that federal courts have to get involved in and have to sort of in many ways sort of figure out what a First Amendment would mean in this new context. And then finally, uh, you have uh, a shift in the kind of religious pluralism that we have in the United States. Uh, and one of those shifts is a rise in the number of people who have no religious affiliation and uh, the rise of a kind of hostility to religion that is coupled with a kind of extreme view of 
what the Constitution means when it says there shall be no establishment of religion, um, which if uh, uh, actually I, I'm, I'm slightly um, mangling the phrase myself. What it actually says is Congress, Congress shall make no, no law respecting establishment of religion. And who knows what respecting means? Well, I mean, that's that that is compatible with the view or at least in theory, it's arguably compatible with the view that uh, if you've got a state establishment of religion, Congress isn't to make any law that has anything to do with it, that either enshrines it or uh, that gets rid of it or hurts it. Um, but, uh, but that possibility has tended to be thrown out as we've uh, incorporated the doctrine. I'm hearing echoes of your teacher and mine, Professor Robbie George from, from Princeton, who uh, sent a wave of gasps through the lecture hall when he mentioned that I think it was Connecticut that had a uh, state established church. I think it was, a, I want to say, a congregationalist state church. And uh, it wasn't litigated out of existence. It was legislated out of existence, uh, which is, I think, pretty shocking to people who have uh, accepted the the new establishment clause uh, paradigm. Uh but putting that aside for a second, and uh, I do want to get back to today's debates about exercise and establishment and the relationship between the two, and we'll get to those later. Uh, I'd like to st- set the stage for Professor McConnell's lecture. Uh, it's 1992. George H.W. Bush is still president. He won't be a few months later, but he still is. Uh, we've gotten the Employment Division versus Smith. Uh, we've gotten that that uh, opinion. Uh, Justice Scalia gives one of his most controversial uh, opinions ever uh, in which he uh, holds that a general law of neutral applicability, am I, is that the, the right phrasing? I think that's the right phrasing. The neutral, neutral law, law of, general, of general applicability. Right. Uh, I, I spoonerized it. Uh, we, we don't have the Church of the Lukimi, Lukumi Babalu Aye versus the city of Hialeah. We certainly don't have the Religious Freedom Restoration Act on the federal level. And we don't have state RIFRA laws that become so controversial in the years after. So uh, can you talk about some of the controversies sure. that were bubbling at the time uh, and how they might address the freedom from religion element that Professor McConnell uh, alludes to in the title of his lecture? So the McConnell lecture, the Bradley lecture that he gave was at a time when I would say the court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence was uh, particularly aggressive. It was finding things that were construed as endorsements of religion or too close to a state religion, even though, you know, the the argument that, that, say, in the case of Lee versus Weissman in 1992, a uh, prayer at graduation was really the government establishing a church, you know, it was arguably pretty tenuous, and striking down all of those establishment clause violations. Um, Since then, the Supreme Court, and partly because of the arguments of people like Professor McConnell and at one point Judge McConnell, um, the court has scaled back that, uh, that kind of aggressive policing of the public square for signs of religion. Um, And you don't, and they're not, they're not as they don't loom as large in American politics, whereas sort of the the nativity scene cases were once uh, once a very big part of our public debate. The um, at the same time, free exercise arguments have become more and more contested, uh, and he he brings up both of those. So in 1990, as you mentioned, the Supreme Court had said, "Well, let me actually take a step." backward from that. 1963, the Supreme Court starts to hold that there are that laws that are on their face neutral if they burden the exercise of religion. Um, they can be, uh, they, they, exemptions to those laws can be required as a matter of the free exercise of religion. Now, exemptions of that kind have long been a part of American law, um, even when they were not primarily or even very importantly given out by the courts. So, for example, prohibition um, 
of the prohibition of alcohol is implemented through the Volstead Act, and the Volstead Act has a specific exemption for the sacramental use of alcohol uh, in religious ceremonies, um, such as the Catholic Mass. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is not an especially controversial point back then. Nobody says, well, that's an establishment of religion, for example. And uh, by the time that McConnell's speaking, people are beginning to say, we can't even, uh, not only are exemptions not constitutionally obligatory, they can't even be allowed because they're, they're too, that's too pro-religion a stance. Anyway, in 1990, Scalia, writing for the Supreme Court, uh, decides that this is that these exemptions, these court mandated exemptions, are a mistake. That they don't have a First Amendment basis. And in re- this is about <clears throat> the case has to do with unemployment benefits for two um, counselors who uh, used peyote and issued the defense that they should be eligible for these benefits because they were using the peyote and Native American religious ceremonies. They were fired from their ceremonies. jobs. They, right. they wanted to still collect unemployment benefits. Right. Exactly. And, uh, and Justice Scalia said that that is okay, that the court shouldn't give them an exemption from that law. Well, there's a pretty strong bipartisan reaction that um, holds that religious believers' rights need to be respected. And this is something that passes nearly, this causes the the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act nearly by acclamation in 1993. President Bill Clinton signs it. It's got the enthusiastic support of um, then House Democrat Chuck Schumer, who's now, of course, the Senate Democratic leader. And um, what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says is if a law, even a law of of, uh, general applicability, um, imposes a burden on the free exercise of religion that a person can apply for an exemption to a court. Um, if uh, he, And the court has to give that exemption if uh, the burden is not the least restrictive means of pursuing a compelling governmental interest. And in recent years, we have had a lot of pro- high-profile cases um, the Hobby Lobby case being one of them, where the argument was that a law that's not meant to single out religious believers, um, just requiring um, all companies, or almost all companies, to provide uh, various benefits for their employees, including contraception, sterilization, uh, and a class of, of excuse me, a class of contraceptives that some people believe cause abortions or cause things that are equivalent to abortions. If you have a religious objection to that, should you be allowed not to comply with that mandate, or at least not to comply with it to the extent that you have the religious problem? And of course, in a a bitterly divided five to four court said, in that case, in 2014, yes, um, you do get that exemption. So this has become increasingly controversial for a number of reasons. One, a lot of the progressives who were once on the side of these sorts of exemptions have said, well, what we had in mind was small minority religions that need to be protected from the majority. Uh, We don't think it should be uh, for the benefit of these gigantic churches um, that, you know, can defend their interests. That's one. I think it's it's a less dominant strand. I think that's an argument that runs into all kinds of problems that we can go into, if you'd like. But I think the more dominant strand of uh, progressive rethinking of this has been the argument that, well, it's fine for religious liberty to be used as a shield for the religious believer, but it can't be a sword. It can't be a vehicle by which religious believers can inflict harms on other people. So, for example, you shouldn't be allowed to use a claim of religious liberty uh, to discriminate and harm people by discrimination. So if you are a baker, you shouldn't be allowed to discriminate against um, a same-sex couple that wants a wedding cake um, be- just because you don't approve of same-sex marriage. You shouldn't be able to, as the, the Do No Harm Act, the new, uh, new uh, democratic bill that tries to scale back the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, says you shouldn't be able to allow, you shouldn't be able to inflict, quote, dignitary harm 
the idea being basically that you can't um, insult an ambassador. It sounds like well, it's, it's so if uh, you know if you turn down the uh, this couple. In theory, you'd say, well, what's the real harm? They can go down the street. There are many, many, many bakeries in this country. It's not a monopoly. But it's an affront to their dignity. It's an affront to their dignity. Um, And so so that's the argument um, that is currently being made. Now, I think this runs up against uh, the... So the claim that is being made is that religious liberty has been, quote, weaponized by religious conservatives. Um, because it used to be a shield and is now being used as a sword. Um, and it seems to me that that, is, that gets the, the history of this just entirely backward, because one of our oldest traditions of religious exemption has been that people with sincere religious objections can be exempted from military service. That imposes a very, very serious harm on third parties, which is that somebody else has to go in that person's place, um, particularly in the context of a draft, and which we've had for most of our history. And that means you could be subject to being killed, um, which is arguably even worse than having to find a different baker or florist. So what's changed here is not that some people have moved to a wildly new, expansive reading of religious liberty. What's changed is that the people on the other side have become less and less tolerant of those claims of religious liberty. I want to go a little deeper into all of those things uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you for that very helpful overview of the religious freedom landscape. And with that, we're going to proceed to Michael McConnell's 1992 lecture, Freedom of Religion versus Freedom from Religion. We'll be back. What was the case about? It was about a graduation ceremony one evening in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, the uh, Nathan Bishop Middle School. uh, And the principal of the uh, middle school, uh, following the practice of uh, choosing clergy of various different denominations, invited the local rabbi, uh, Rabbi Gutterman, Uh, to deliver the invocation and the benediction uh, for the uh, ceremony. Rabbi uh, Gutterman uh, uttered the the following uh, prayer. Uh, God of the free, hope of the brave, uh, for the legacy of America where diversity is celebrated and the rights of minorities are protected, we thank you. May these young men and women grow up to enrich it. Uh, For the liberty of America, we thank you. May these new graduates grow up to guard it. For the political process of America, in which all its citizens may participate, for its court system, where all may seek justice, we thank you. I don't know if later Rabbi Gutterman regretted that part of the prayer. Um, May those we honor this morning always turn to it in trust. Uh, For the destiny of America, we thank you. May the graduates of Nathan Bishop Middle School so live that they might help to share it. May our aspirations for our country and for these young people who are our hope for the future be richly fulfilled. Amen. I don't know how many people were in the uh, audience that night, but among the audience were uh, two uh, who had attempted to uh, get a restraining order uh, from the local uh, court to prevent this prayer from being uh, stated and later uh, filed a uh, lawsuit in federal district court to make sure that it didn't happen uh, again. Uh, Deborah uh, Weissman and her uh, and her uh, father uh, objected to uh, being uh, uh, subjected to this prayer as part of the public uh, graduation ceremony, and the case winded its way uh, up to the uh, United States Supreme Court, where the uh, uh, justices, in a uh, very close uh, decision with numerous separate opinions, uh, held that the Weissmans were right that their constitutional uh, rights under the First Amendment were violated by the uh, delivery of this prayer and that an injunction should should hold. Now I present this uh, case as Exhibit 1 as an example of what I would call the freedom from religion. Of course, uh, Deborah Weissman was not required to be present at all. If she was present, uh, she was not uh, required to stand. Uh, If she stood, she was not required to bow her head. If she bowed her head, she was not required to fold her hands. Even if she folded her hands, she was not required to enter into the prayer other than simply to uh, remain uh, silent uh, to it. Um, And thus, 
uh, and thus this serves as, a, as an ideal example of the um, extreme care with which our legal system now treats the uh, right to be uh, free from, from any possible uh, imposition of, uh, uh, of religion uh, upon our, our lives. Now the extraordinary degree of attention given to this case uh, is what strikes me as the most interesting thing about it. Uh, this demonstrates uh, what the press and the dominant culture thinks is at the heart of the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Uh, Justice Blackmun has gone so far as to substitute in one of an opinion in another case the term secular liberty as his description of what the religion clauses are uh, all about. Three times in recent years, the Supreme Court has issued multiple lengthy opinions telling us when it is permissible for a state to include a nativity scene or a menorah in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, de a December uh, display. For those of you who don't follow the ins and outs of it, I don't want to get into tremendous detail, but the, uh, but the law is something like this, that uh, menorahs are okay so long as they're in close proximity to Christmas trees, Nativity scenes require a little bit more in the way of kitschy uh, stuff on the side. Uh, a reindeer, Santa Claus is uh, talking, wishing well is very helpful. Uh, a, a, uh, we do know from the, a case out of Pittsburgh that a nativity scene surrounded by wreaths and poinsettias, that's not enough. Uh, that uh, the, that nativity scene is unconstitutional. The uh, uh, practitioners dubbed this the three plastic animals rule. Now, all of these uh, cases have something in common, which is that they have literally nothing to do with freedom of religion. Nothing to do with freedom of religion. There is not a single person in these cases, however uh, extreme or, or far from the uh, 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 from the mainstream, not a single person who has been obstructed by government action from following a sincerely religious practice or way of life. You do not have religious people trying to follow their religions who have been in any way been, been interfered uh, with by this. These cases are really about the secularization of the public sphere. They are not about religious freedom uh, at all. Now my point is not that Lee versus Weissman or any of these other cases was wrongly decided. My point is that the Supreme Court and the news media are so preoccupied with the finer points of freedom from religion that far more important, far more important cases of genuine freedom of religion have been completely uh, neglected. Uh, let me give a few examples of cases that came up at the same time as Lee versus Weissman, cases that the Supreme Court refused to hear. One case is a case from Colorado in which a public school principal told a teacher that he could not read silently to himself from the Bible during silent reading uh, periods uh, in the classroom. Uh, even though there was no evidence in the case that the students even were aware of what book the teacher was reading or could see it, no evidence of this. The principal was, uh, was concerned that the students might in some sense be influenced by the teacher's choice of reading materials and, uh, and thus told him that he could not read uh, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Bible. And in the same case, uh, the principal ordered removal of two books of Bible stories from a classroom library of close to, five, uh, close to 400 uh, uh, books, books that were simply available uh, to the students if they chose to, uh, uh, to take a look at them. It did get to federal court, uh, but the federal court held not only was the principal justified in ordering the teacher not to read silently from the Bible and in from removing these two volumes from the classroom library, the court held that the Establishment Clause requires it. The United States Supreme Court refused to hear the case. Well, in each case, uh, there's an individual or an institution that's trying to live his or her life in accordance with the tenets of their faith. And in each case, government power has been brought to bear against them uh, to, uh, to prevent their uh, uh, doing that, and in each case, uh, the courts have provided no help. Uh, these are cases involving the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Back here in studio with uh, Ramesh Panuru, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Are you still visiting? I've been visiting a long time. Aren't, aren't we all just visiting fellows here? 
which on I, this on this earth really that's i i think the kind of questions that the first amendment ought to protect in in the ways that we answer them and the ways that we think about them and that actually raises an interesting question about what rises to the level of being considered a religious belief rather than a belief about uh, certain ethical or moral systems, and maybe we'll get to that later. But first, I want to ask about Professor McConnell's characterization of the secularization of the public sphere. Now, I think a lot of listeners and observers would say, yes, indeed, that is what the United States was meant to be. This is a secular country based on uh, secular liberal thinking. Uh, so so here's the, the basic question. Is the United States meant to be a fundamentally secular country? And the basic answer, I think, has to be, it depends on what you mean by fundamentally secular, right? So um, is it a country that is open to people of all religions, um, that uh, does not attempt to enforce particular theological dogmas or require participation in sectarian rituals or require affiliation with um a particular religion as a condition of public office. All of these things have been done at various times and places. Some of them have even been done in American states. But especially at the federal level, um, the the U.S. is secular in that sense. Um, is it a secular republic in the sense that people can't bring their religious convictions to them uh, to, to their work in the public square. Can't that seems make, impossible. Right. Can't make arguments based on their religious commitments. People can't vote based on their religious commitments. Well, I mean, in which case, you know, the abolitionist and civil rights movements um, and the peace movement and the pro-life movement and a lot of other um, important sure. parts of our history are, are ruled out of bounds. It would be bad. It would also just not be justiciable if, uh, if you understand religion with any kind of uh, depth. Right. And, you know, for for the vast majority of people who have had their moral and political thinking bound up with religion in some way. It's just, it's hard to do. <laughs> How do you, it's like asking somebody to shed their skin. Uh, so I think Professor McConnell tries throughout his lecture to distinguish between being a secular country, one that is free from religion, and being a neutral uh, republic, being a, uh, a system of, of government that neither favors nor disfavors religion. Mm -hmm. And that seems to implicate the compelling state interest where if it's if if something if a policy serves some good for the state, then it it might uh, adversely affect religious people, religious practice. It might, contrary to the hopes of of uh, some ardent secularists, it might disproportionately benefit. Uh, some religious people. But I think the the problem here is the compelling state interest part, where the state has to weigh its conception of the public good against something, where the court has to weigh in. I is there something fundamentally wrong with scrutinizing laws under the uh, the compelling interest doctrine? Is there any way around this? Is there is there some kind of standard that we can look at that doesn't rely on any kind of higher law or higher belief about the purpose of the state? So um, before I answer that question, I, I want to make just one point about f freedom from religion, which is I believe that McConnell actually at one point in his talk uh, does suggest that there is something worthwhile that could be described as freedom from religion, right? I mean, you know, the the ability to live your life as an atheist and not have um, religious dogmas imposed on you. You could reasonably describe that as freedom from religion. Um, but he wants to make sure, first of all, that it's not elevated over other kinds of religious freedom. Uh, and second, that it is defined in a way that doesn't uh, that doesn't lead to absurd results, right? Freedom from religion can't be you're never subjected to hearing somebody do a prayer. Right. Even if you can be silent during the whole thing or these days you can be checking your iPhone, um, that th that's the that kind of expansive freedom from religion is what uh, he's concerned about. Um, on the question of compelling governmental interest, well, I mean, I think actually, you know, I've spent so many of um, our recent years defending the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and similar state laws um, 
But it's worth pointing out that there are some trade-offs here. And one of them is that um, it ends up requiring uh, a judicial definition of what's a compelling governmental interest. Of course, a lot of a lot of the, our contemporary legal tests involve that kind of thing. Um, but that is one of a few ways in which these RIFRA laws can invite a kind of judicial policymaking. I think that a Religious Freedom Restoration Act is a is far superior to not having one. But I think a the better alternative is the historical alternative, which was that legislatures were alive to the dangers of sweeping laws and would include legislated exemptions. So the Volstead Act, uh, you know, maybe not my favorite law altogether, um, but they did it the right way. They said, well, you know, if we prohibit alcohol, it could have this very serious problem for religious believers, and we're going to to have um, so carve out. a carve-out, right, a legislated carve-out. Um, just And, you know, conscientious objection rules have tended not to be um, judicial inventions, but they've tended to be actual sort of government policy, um, which I, I think that is one of the reasons we do this is because the controversies actually end up being kind of piecemeal controversies. That said, the the principle of RIFRA does strike me as sound, right? I mean, so if you're a conscientious legislator who's trying to think these things through, I think that is basically the correct test that you should be applying. Does the government, you know, is does it have to be doing this? Um, so, you know, if your if your religion involves human sacrifice, well, sorry, you know, uh, we are going to impose a substantial burden on your exercise of that faith. But there's a pretty compelling interest, and this is, in fact, the least restrictive means um, of pursuing it. Is just saying, nope, nobody is allowed to do human sacrifice. There's an interesting test case that. Uh... McConnell invokes actually in the question and answer session after after his lecture, which I'm afraid we're not going to be able to include in this podcast, but you can go to AEI.org and listen to the entire lecture, uh, is the, the problem of polygamy, which the Supreme Court ruled, uh, I believe it was the Reynolds case? Reynolds v. U.S., yes. So uh, in the Reynolds case, the Supreme Court uh, held that uh, polygamy could legitimately be prohibited. It was not a violation of the uh, the free exercise clause. Uh, and now that's actually being turned on its head, and, and one could uh, conceivably imagine a case in the coming years where uh, polygamy is actually presented uh, as a, a lifestyle choice that is deserving of blanket state protection uh, on dignity grounds. Uh, it's a bit of, a, of an interesting turn from the uh, something being disfavored because it was done for religious purposes uh, to being favored almost precisely because a, a traditional view of how many people may participate in a uh, in a marriage is is being overturned. Yeah. So um, McConnell is very critical of Justice Scalia and the Employment Division v. Smith case. Um, but I think one point in favor of what Scalia wrote in that decision is if you look at the Reynolds case, nobody at any point in the argument even raises the possibility that it would be all right for the court to say uh, that religious believers are exempt from these marriage laws um, as, a, you know, just based on the First Amendment. Um, that really doesn't become First Amendment doctrine for, uh, for almost 100 years afterward. Ramesh and I will be back in just a few minutes. Here is another segment of Professor Michael McConnell's 1992 lecture, Freedom of Religion versus Freedom from Religion. The free exercise uh, uh, clause has, uh, is, is on the ropes uh, uh, today. The leading case decided uh, uh, in, in uh, March of 1990 was called Employment Division versus Smith. Um, some of you may have heard of it. It it's, goes frequently under the colloquial title of the peyote case. Uh, because the, uh, the subject of the case is whether a member of the Native American church, which is a, a, uh, an ancient uh, uh, a church, which the central religious ceremony of which involves the, the ingestion of peyote, whether, the, whether they have a right to do that, notwithstanding uh, drug laws of the state of Oregon. 
and the uh, Supreme Court held that <coughs> the uh, free exercise clause of the First Amendment does not uh, preclude the government from enforcing uh, what it calls neutral laws of general applicability. Uh, and since the drug law was not uh, passed specifically against the Native American church or religion uh, in general, it's a law of general applicability and thus can be enforced even though the effect of it is to make the central ceremony of this small but ancient uh, uh, religion uh, illegal. Um, it's not difficult to think of the ominous implications of this uh, of this decision. We have, for example, a neutral and generally applicable law that prohibits uh, employment discrimination on the basis of gender. The conservative solution to the problem of church and state um, has by and large been to remove the courts uh, from the fray. Uh, that is, that uh, in marked contrast to the heyday of the Warren Burger eras when uh, the Establishment Clause was being given all kinds of extreme and bizarre uh, interpretations, but the Free Exercise Clause was likewise given a rather uh, expansive view. The conservative approach has been to, uh, uh, to, to bring in uh, uh, both clauses so that the government is, will have uh, more discretion to uh, decide what the terms of uh, relation between uh, religion and government are going to be. But that can't be the right solution as a legal proposition because, after all, uh, the religion clauses of the First Amendment are there in black and white. We're not talking about uh, uh, nebulous rights of privacy that have been concocted by the courts on the basis of their own uh, judgments about, about what ought to be done. Uh, the free exercise of religion is, uh, is right there at the beginning of the... Uh, of the First Amendment, and the Establishment Clause is, 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 is right there. Uh, these clauses were not enacted because the people back in 1789 had faith in the new federal government not to uh, infringe their liberties. They were not enacted in order to give a wide degree of discretion to the government with respect to religious matters. They were enacted uh, largely at the behest of small denominations that had not gotten a fair shake from the government and it was determined that this new potentially threatening federal government was not going to uh, 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 be able to uh, oppress them in the same way that the colonial and state governments uh, uh, in many instances had, uh, had been able to, uh, uh, to do so. How then might one uh, go about thinking about freedom of religion if we are to be serious about freedom of uh, religion. Uh, it seems to me that the, th that the way to begin is to think about the various ways in which government power is deployed uh, so as to interfere with uh, religious liberty. And there are basically three categories of governmental power that I think are important here. Uh, the first is the power to regulate, either through the criminal law or through uh, other forms of, uh, of uh, regulation or, or uh, civil lawsuits or, or whatever. The second is the spending power, the command over resources, the ability to tax all of us and then use money, uh, uh, channel money only to government favored uh, activities. And the third is the government's control over the institutions for the transmission of culture. And here I think particularly of the, uh, of the schools. And in each, with respect to each of these types of governmental power, we need to think about what the proper uh, rules ought to be for, uh, for freedom uh, of religion to survive the potentially hostile deployment of that, uh, of that power. First, with respect to the government power of regulation, uh, here we're talking about both regulation of religious institutions the example here would be the New Orleans Baptist Seminary uh, being uh, regulated under the uh, contract law of the state of Louisiana. Uh, with respect to this, uh, there is good news and there's bad news in the current uh, movement on the Supreme Court. Um, the good news is that the Supreme Court in several recent decisions has made it pretty clear that when the government chooses to accommodate 
religious institutions or religiously motivated individuals by carving out exemptions from otherwise generally applicable laws that the court will not accept in extraordinary circumstances hold that, uh, that that is unconstitutional as an establishment of religion. Now that may seem obvious. It may seem obvious, but it is very far uh, from obvious. And you will still find a large uh, contingent of scholars in the field uh, and lower court decisions that reason as follows, that to exempt a religious institution, a church or synagogue or mosque, from a generally applicable uh, regulation benefits that uh, institution. And it benefits them as opposed to a comparable secular institution. It gives them an advantage. And what is the Establishment Clause about, after all? It's a prohibition, they say, of giving any advantages uh, to, uh, to religion over non-religion. You can't favor religion over uh, non-religion. And so the argument went, uh, it is actually unconstitutional for the state to uh, exempt religious institutions or religiously motivated action from uh, uh, generally applicable uh, laws. That rule, uh, which never, I should say, never actually uh, got full-throated support in a Supreme Court opinion, although a few of them come pretty close, came uh, pretty close, but that, that rule would be absolutely devastating uh, to religious freedom in the United States. Absolutely devastating because there are numerous laws that apply uh, to religious and non-religious institutions alike that are ordinary aspects of the legal landscape, but as applied to uh, religions uh, 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 and to religious institutions in particular, uh, uh, would be the uh, end of their ability to uh, to operate uh, according to the uh, to their uh, faith. It, the second form of government power is the power to tax and spend. Uh, this is what the government does more of than anything else I can think of, and the impact on religion is uh, quite uh, considerable. Uh, religious institutions have been the most important uh, part of the social welfare and educational aspects of our culture since long before the government ever got involved. There were uh, religious hospitals before there were ever governmental hospitals. There were relig religious schools before there were ever uh, governmental uh, schools. But the modern welfare state, uh, uh, the government has, in fact, uh, uh, gotten there now. And the government has far greater command over resources than the uh, uh, contributions of the church members uh, have. And in fact, the presence, the very presence of the government in these areas frequently is a discouragement to volunteer uh, contributions for private efforts uh, along the same uh, line. Now the question is how will these activities be administered? Will they be uh, administered in a way that preserves pluralism and diversity so that there will be a wide range of service providers with different philosophies, different ideologies, some religious, some not religious, maybe a Methodist uh, uh, school as well as a, a, uh, an Orthodox Jewish school, or will uh, the uh, power of the state uh, to tax and spend be used in order to constrict the uh, range of choices that are available uh, in, in this field? Well, here the Supreme Court has done tremendous damage uh, to the cause of freedom of, of religion. Um, in a pair of cases, uh, Lemon versus Kurtzman and Tilton versus Richardson, uh, the Supreme Court uh, announced two different rules uh, with respect to the receipt of government money by religiously affiliated organizations. One half of the rule applies to what are called pervasively sectarian organizations, and the other uh, applies to religiously affiliated organizations that are not pervasively sectarian. Incidentally, the Supreme Court has never told us what the definition is of those two, but uh, that's a relatively minor uh, uh, point. Now, the rule for pervasively sectarian organizations is that they are excluded from uh, participation in public programs. They can't take the money at all. Uh, the rule for non-pervasively sectarian organizations is that they can take the money, but only on the condition that they 
uh, that they secularize their program. Uh, and so here is the choice. I mean, one choice leads to secularization by the funneling of resources that are collected from the taxes of everyone, but only going to one sector within the, uh, uh, within the private educational philanthropic uh, uh, community. Uh, so that's one possibility. The other possibility, I think, is much worse, though. The, the, uh, uh, it, it may seem better, yes, uh, the Catholic school can get uh, money for textbooks, but they have to be the same textbooks that are used in the public schools. Thus, the cost to the Catholic school of participating in this program is that they sacrifice the very thing that made their schools distinctive to begin with. Now, there have been a couple of cases recently that take a different approach and that I would like to commend uh, to you as the correct rule if we are concerned about freedom of religion. And the rule is this that when the government is giving out money to private organizations, it must do so without regard to whether the particular institution has a religious commitment, and without regard to whether uh, the, uh, that organization engages in specifically religious activities as part of its uh, program, that there should no more be discrimination against uh, recipient organizations on the basis of their religious speech or their religious commitments that the proper rule should be one of equality. Organizations should not receive money because they are religious, nor should they uh, uh, be denied money because they are religious. The question should be, are they delivering the particular service that the government is subsidizing? Now, the third area of government power uh, is the control over institutions for the transmission of culture. The problem with, with these cases is that any time you focus upon a particular thing that the government does that affects the culture, that particular thing that you're focusing on is going to assume an inordinate degree of importance. You look just at a nativity scene and you say, well, uh, nativity scene is obviously a religious symbol and for the government to do that obviously endorses uh, uh, religion in some, uh, in some sense. Uh, but, but the problem is that one has to look at all of the various things that the government is doing with respect to culture because it isn't as if the government is just plopping down a nativity scene and is doing nothing else. Uh, the government is promoting culture in a wide variety of different ways. And what one ought to be concerned about is the overall impact of government conduct upon the culture. I want to concentrate for a few minutes on schools, though, because they are the most important aspect of government power over the uh, transmission of culture. And so many of our cases involving uh, uh, the religion clauses have uh, taken place in the public schools. And the conclusion has been unanimous. I have yet to see any serious study of the curriculum that does not reach the conclusion that religion has been systematically excluded from the public school uh, curriculum in a wide variety of subjects. Uh, uh, history is another uh, area where it is uh, almost laughable uh, the way in which the uh, leading history textbooks, without any exceptions, have uh, simply eliminated uh, the important part that religion has played in world history and in uh, U.S. Uh, history. The, uh, the Supreme Court has said of, of all of this uh, on a number of occasions that it's uh, perfectly legitimate for the uh, public schools to engage in the inculcation of values. And uh, the values that we're talking about here are the values of those people who run the schools, not necessarily the values of the, uh, of the parents. Back in studio with Ramesh Panuriel, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, prolific writer, commentator, and uh, an expert on religious freedom. Uh, so let's talk about the current landscape. As you mentioned in your national review piece uh, on the first freedom fading, uh, some Democratic presidential candidates, well, it's not they've dropped out, but uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, notably said, yes, I would revoke the 501c3 tax-exempt status of religious organizations that do not accept or promote certain progressive social orthodoxies. 
something that got less attention was the uh, House Ways and Means uh, Committee, some subcommittee hearing on how the tax code subsidizes hate, which was basically an exercise in uh, in, in talking through those same issues. Is is this a new development? Has there always been this push to to really really fundamentally sh- change, fundamentally end uh, religious freedom as we know it? Is this is it crude, cynical politics? It, does it have staying power? How do you see it? So in principle, not having any exemption from taxes for religious organizations or non-religious nonprofits, I think, is a better idea than having an exemption that picks and chooses based on particular religious beliefs, um, which is what Beto O'Rourke had suggested. I think there is probably a lot more support among progressives for getting rid of religious exemptions altogether. I don't know if they've thought through that that should also, I think, mean that the non-religious nonprofits are not exempt. Um, What I think, I think a lot of the history of this and the logic of it um, has been forgotten. And so, you know, you were saying sort of subsidizing hate. Uh, The idea that it's, that it's a kind of favor from the government, um, that these things are exempt, uh, is, I think, wrong. The fundamental justification for exempting religious organizations from taxation is that in the American understanding of church and state, the government just doesn't have jurisdiction over the church. And to the extent that non-religious nonprofits have been able to avail themselves of the same um, the same treatment, like this organization, American Enterprise Institute, for example, it's by analogy, it's by piggybacking on the religious organizations. So to the extent that progressives want to just get rid of the religious ones, I think they've just got it completely backward. I do think that this is going to become a, a bigger issue. It's true that O'Rourke was basically kind of slapped down by a lot of other Democrats, but it's also true that the Democratic Party has moved on religious liberty. You know, they were all unanimously for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and now well, the, they're mostly wanting to scale it back. The fact that O'Rourke felt that that would it was, gin up, it was gin up some line. support. That, it was an applause line at his town hall. That, people, bit, people cheered for it. Right. Telling. So, yes, I think it is telling. Uh, and I, do, I just think that um, as the sway of religion over our society has declined... Uh, I think it becomes harder for people to see what's so special uh, about religion. Why does it need its own particular protection? Why does your right to, you know, go to the church of your choice, um, what's different from, like, going to any other building of your choice? Why does it need a specific carve-out. I think libertarians have a hard time Mm -hmm. with that, uh, and I think increasingly Americans are going to have a hard time answering that question to the extent that religious belief is declining. I'm uh, Nonetheless, I'm reminded of a recent uh, Babylon Bee headline, I think. It was uh, Christians forced to choose between party that is... uh, that makes a mockery of their religion and party that is openly hostile to it. It's a... uh, it's a confounding time to be a religious person in the United States. Now, one case where you might conceivably argue that there actually is a state subsidy for religion or uh, that that is the issue at hand is the Espinoza versus, I think it's the Department of Revenue of Montana, whoever administers some kind of educational tax credit uh, that some students in Montana want to use for uh, religious schools. And I'm, I'm, of being a bit reductive here, but that is the the gist of the case. Uh, what kind of recent precedent does that invoke that maybe we've missed uh, in the time since 1992? Where do you anticipate the court going? So the the question really here is to somewhat simplify it is sort of this kind of um, public policy that helps religion, whether intentionally or indirectly or unintentionally and indirectly, um, the court was once pretty close to saying that kind of thing was prohibited, and now it's wondering whether it's mandatory. 
essentially, right? Mm-hmm. It's gone through a period of being kind of allowed, and now the question is it's mandatory. And the argument is this. You had the series of amendments in the states, the so-called Blaine Amendments, named after James G. Blaine, Republican senator from Maine, continental liar from the state of Maine, if you remember your political slogans of the 19th century. Um, Blaine amendments were designed to uh, counter the rising political influence of Catholic immigrants in the U.S. and really, um, in some cases, have very tight language saying you can't have direct or indirect, just no public money broadly construed going to religious organizations. So then the question becomes, so if your institution is... um, doing all the same things as a secular institution that can receive this public money or a tax credit, because there, of course, is a question whether that should be construed as public money. Um, but can can you exclude another institution just because they also have have a dedication to a higher being? Um, and the church, excuse me, and the Supreme Court has considered this question in a variety of ways. Um, and it's considered it in particular. Um, there was a case uh, out of Missouri a few years ago where the question was um, if the government is running a program, the state government, that helps schools um, uh, repave their playgrounds, Playground case. Um, can a Lutheran school participate in that? And um, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, Justice Sotomayor, who's a, as was as she often is on the extreme left end of that, and was basically saying no, it's uh, it's not even it's not permissible uh, for that to happen. And the court ended up um, ruling that no, the state can't exclude um, the church. And so, in a way, this is the next logical step. the The next logical step would be, I think, to say, if you have a public program, its purpose is not to encourage religion, but can religious organizations compete? Uh, or participate on an equal footing with other organizations. The, uh, I think that the um, it makes a lot of sense to say the answer is yes. Um, that uh, that if we're going to have, you know, certainly if we're going to have an incorporation of the First Amendment against the states, then that has to be the policy. I think it's a testament to the thinking of. Uh great legal minds like Michael McConnell that we've uh, we've seen a turn against the systematic disfavoring of religion. Uh, and as the last question, I, I want to uh, philosophize a bit about what religion really means, uh, because as as you know and have, have probably thought about uh, a great many times, lots of beliefs or understandings about the human condition, the nature of uh, our bodies and our souls rises to a uh, a level that is borderline religious, right? It it might rely on faith. It might rely on a particular understanding of how we got here. Some of which might be scientific, and some of which might be uh, something that that rises beyond uh, science. It has the court? Will the court uh, ever really narrow down what? what it means to be religious. You said dedication to a higher being. I think that is a good start. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not sure that something needs to be, that a, a practice or a belief needs to be dedicated to a higher be- being to be uh, religious. Are there other articles of faith that could reasonably be presented before a court as a form of religion? So religion is notoriously hard to define. Um, and... Uh, that is one of several good reasons that the courts have tended to have a wide leeway uh, and and not to want to impose a restrictive definition, which I think that is the safer course. Grant good faith. Right. Sincerely held. That's yeah, I mean, you, you can't yeah. sort of uh, start the church of no taxation and say, you know, our religious belief is we shouldn't be subject to any taxes at all. And go to court and say, you know, this is my religion, right? I mean, I think you, the, the courts can reasonably ask, think, well, is this a sincere religion? We gather at Cato on Sunday. Right, yes. Uh, but but this also gets back to my, my previous point about what is the purpose of religious freedom. And it seems to me that the the 
fundamental argument for it has to depend on the idea that there is a there is a, just a basic good of contemplating whether there is a higher being or higher beings to whom we owe obligations, uh, whether there is a kind of more ultimate reality than the one we ordinarily perceive. Uh, and you don't have to, I think, answer those questions affirmatively to think that, for example, if there's a God, then that is an important question. Um, and then to think that that kind of contemplation, that free contemplation, uncoerced, is a valuable thing. But if, you, if you've if lost that religious sense, that sense of the transcendent, that, that, uh, that more than material things matter, then I think it becomes really, really hard to explain why there should be such a thing as religious freedom. Ramesh Panuru, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Bradley Lectures podcast from the American Enterprise Institute. The Bradley Lectures were given for more than a quarter century at AEI thanks to the generous sponsorship of the Lyons and Harry Bradley Foundation. AEI senior fellow Carlin Bowman and I hope you enjoy our revival of these lectures. If you do, please show your support by giving us a like and a comment and subscribing to our channel. And stay tuned for new episodes as we bring the wisdom of the recent past to the most pressing issues of the present. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us again next time on the Bradley Lectures Podcast.